evening. Uh, go ahead and grab a songbook if you prefer that, and we'll sing number 622. 622. There's a message true and glad for the simple and the sad. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. It will give them courage new. It will help them to be true. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring out. Merrily make the world. Good evening. Nice to have you with us tonight. Nice to have you out there in YouTube land. And would you bow with me in prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, you are truly an awesome God. Father, we came before you this week for our brethren, for the problems they had in their lives. And we're truly grateful for the improvements we've seen for our sister and brother and their family and for Chris's wife, and so many other prayers, too, that we might not be aware of, but we know that you're there. You're there for us in so many ways, and we truly appreciate that and are so grateful. We're thankful for Jesus, for the love that he's shown us, for the salvation we have through him, for his message, your word. We pray, Father, that as we dwell in Delve into your word this evening that you'll uh, open our hearts to the message that Jerry has for us, the encouraging words. And pray, Father, that uh, those who are, are also listening 
audibly on their TV, and I pray that you'll bless them as well as they have listened to the messages. We're grateful for a time together, and uh, we look forward to the day when we can all be back together and uh, encouraging, encouraging each other, spending time more time in fellowship, and just help us not to lose heart. Help us to remember that you're there with us, and we thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, we hope it's a good sign of things to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 659. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to
Good evening. Tonight is my privilege to bring a short, and I've been told it has to be short, devotional. You know, and it, it could happen. Not very likely, but it could happen. Do you like answering questions? Sometimes people will ask embarrassing questions. We used to have an associate preacher here, Reed Moon, who now is terrorizing Western Pennsylvania, but he had this knack of asking questions that would make you uncomfortable. He had no boundaries. Things like, are you still beating your wife type questions? You know, you know, uh, how's this drinking thing coming? Have you gotten rid of your girlfriend and did your wife find out? You know, all kinds of really difficult questions. Uh, something, a question that most married men will appreciate. Does this outfit make me look fat? There isn't a man in this room that can answer that. Not if he wants to live. <laughs> there's, there's a saying that women who gain a few pounds live longer than men who notice. <laughs> you know, how do you think the Reds are going to do this year? How do you think the Yankees are going to do this year? In Scripture, we read. There's, there's uh, some questions, and, and we'll look at four of them, and uh, hopefully you'll follow the progression, and, and you'll, you'll get the point where I'm, I'm going to get to, Lord willing. First is in John chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verse 19. This is uh, John the Baptist has begun his ministry, and he's out baptizing in the Jordan River, calling people to repent. And because he's starting to gather such a following, his the, the leaders send some priests and some Levites to talk to him. So in verse 19, we read, This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. <coughs> Excuse me. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And so, the, you know, as, in our study of Acts, there's a recurring theme in that Paul gets really successful in preaching the gospel. The Jewish residents of the town where he's being successful gets jealous and gets angry. Well, that's a tradition that goes way back even, you know, the reason why they were sending people to ask John, who are you? And uh, it's because they wanted to know if another false religion or another false messiah was, was on the scene. Then in Matthew chapter 16, there's another incident which I think is, is relevant. And this is the, the one where Jesus is asking, who do men say I am? Beginning in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? 
And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then in verse 20, he says, then he warned his disciples that they should not tell no one, they should tell no one, not tell no one, they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So when Peter confessed that he is the Christ, Jesus did not deny it. And he warned his disciples, don't tell anybody that I am the Christ. Then in Mark chapter 14, we thought, this is the time where Jesus had been arrested. The, the disciples have been all scattered. And uh, Jesus is before the high priest. And in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 61, we find, but he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And this account in Mark, what the high priest was saying is that I'm basically, I command you before God to answer me truthfully, are you the Son of God? And Jesus answered him truthfully and said, I am. And lastly, let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. This should be familiar to many of us. Acts chapter 2 talks about the day of Pentecost and the indwelling of the Spirit unto the apostles. And after they had been imbued with the Spirit and giving the, the power that, that the Spirit delivered to them, they went out, Peter, and they were speaking all kinds of languages, languages which they had not learned. And Peter uh, gave a sermon. And part of the sermon, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, he says this, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over to the by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to his agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And then in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we all are witnesses, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So people have been asking, who is this Jesus, this Nazarene carpenter? And we just read some cases, some excerpts of uh, accounts where it was clear that this Jesus, not John the Baptist, who said that he wasn't worthy to untie the footstraps of the sandals, of the one who was to come after him, the Messiah, the, the one known as the Christ. Um, and when he was standing before 
the high priest. The high priest asked him directly, are you the son of God? He said, yes. I, he says, are you the Christ? He says, yes, I am. When, he, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then on the day of Pentecost, Peter left no doubt that Jesus was the Christ of prophecy, that Jesus was this one spoken of by the prophets. Jesus is the Christ, which was he was attested by God as by the miracles that, G, that God performed through Jesus. So all of us are going to have to answer that question. Who do you say? that Jesus is? If you're a Christian, you have already answered that question. You know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's the person who John the Baptist said when he saw him approaching, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Those of us, those who are not Christians, have not answered that question or answered it incorrectly. So I urge you tonight to really think about that question. And if you're not a Christian, I urge you to consider and to think really hard about becoming one. And if you're a Christian and you haven't been living according to the way God would have you, well, today's the day of repentance. Today's the day of salvation. It's not too late to turn around. So if you're subject to our invitation, please... Uh, would I sing a song to encourage you? Give me the Bible, star of gladness, gleaming to cheer the wanderer, Lord, in tempest saws. No storm can hide that radiance, peaceful beaming. Some good news from Juliet and Marco Torres. Uh, their son does not have seizures, has not been having seizures. He has some sort of affection, infection that seems to be responding to the antibodies, antibiotics that are being given to him. So thank God for that. This weekend we have our prayer vigil beginning on Saturday. 
at the men's breakfast. And if you have not picked a slot, time is rapidly running out. Wes? Yep. Uh, Dave says that there are still slots for 11.30 to 1.30 a.m., uh, 3.30 a.m., and 4.30 a.m., and those are half-hour slots. Send him a text message. So if you're a night owl. Get you down. Or uh, if, what's, what's that? An early, early, early. Where, where you can't sleep. Insomniac. Or you have kids. Parents. Insomniac, yes. Oh, okay. We, we have some time for you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Dave Scary, or you can sign up with Brother Stephen Bell. Uh, let's see. Tours. The ah. Also, this Saturday, do not forget to turn your clocks ahead an hour. Some more. I put it on the Facebook page last week that that's the time it was, and somebody. Sending me a loud screaming message. No, it's next week. So, <laughs> so it's this Saturday, the fourteenth. So please remember the turn. Otherwise, you'll have a surprise when you come to church. <laughs> Either we'll be—I don't know if we'll be—if you'll be too late, if you'll be way too early. One of them will happen. So. Uh, and also, we're getting a lot of really well thought out. People took some time to, to consider which one of the two men you would like to see come and work with us here in Manchester. And on behalf of Barry and myself, thank you very much for taking the time to be so thoughtful and so thorough in your responses. Uh, it's, it's been really, really encouraging, really uplifting. And... Uh, we're not using Dominion voting machines, so. <laughs> so. so. Number 449. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Book of Acts. When we last left our intrepid explorers, the Apostle Paul and his entourage, they had experienced a beating with rods, they had been locked up in jail. They had experienced a earthquake. Uh, they were singing and praying loudly in, uh, in the jail. And the earthquake was so violent that the doors sprung open, the chains fell off the prisoners, and the jailer, thinking that everybody had escaped, drew his sword with the intent to kill himself. 
But the apostle Paul said, wait, we're still here. Don't harm yourself. So uh, the jailer was touched. Because prisoners, when a guard wants to kill themselves, generally doesn't stop them. Uh, so uh, just, just one or two things that I'd, I'd like to point out is that before the earthquake hit, in verse 27, we read that the jailer was asleep. And that he woke up to find the prison doors had opened. And the question is, is how did Paul know that this jailer was about to kill himself? Because in verse 29, he called for light, the jailer calls for lights and rushed in. And trembling, he falls down before Paul and Silas. And that kind of begs the question, what was the source of the jailer's fear? Was it the earthquake? Or was it the fact that he, he thought he had lost his life because his prisoners had escaped? Or did he suspect that Paul and Silas were something different than just mere mortal men and that they were responsible for the earthquake? In any event, the jailer was scared, was afraid. It's in verse 30, he, uh, brings, he brings Paul and Silas out and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and his household. So here we have again, hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and the jailer obeying the gospel. And that's where we ended last, last week. Well, yeah, if, you think, if you're kind of thinking that they're the ones that caused the earthquake, you would sh show a, mo a modicum of reverence. But I, I, I kind of think there might have been something more. Because I think the jailer realized, or might have realized, that there was something special about these men. Hence the question, what must I do to be saved? Because during the night, he had to have heard them singing hymns and, and praying, and oftentimes when we pray, I, I, well, maybe you don't, but oftentimes I will pray scripture, particularly when I've, I've blown it. I uh, kind of use Psalm 51 as, uh, as a template for, for a particular prayer, acknowledging that, yeah, I, what I did was wrong, Acknowledging that it was you and only you, God, against whom I have sinned. Asking God to create in me a clean heart, to renew a, sp a right spirit within me. And cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew in my life the joy of my salvation and create a new spirit within me. And there are plenty of other scriptures which are worthy to be prayed. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, so uh, by praying out loud, Paul and Silas were broadcasting God's word. God's word is powerful, as we had already discussed uh, in, in a 
another lesson. So, and, and another, another point to be made is that when the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? He didn't quite have enough information. Even after Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for your sins. If a person is baptized not understanding what they're doing, is that baptism effective? Have they truly repented? Have they truly obeyed the gospel? But we read in verse 32, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And it was after that that they were baptized. So at the point where he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Again, this is my humble opinion. I don't think he had quite all the information he needed to make that decision. After they spoke, after Paul continued to speak to him, then, at that point, he had the, the knowledge to knowingly, to intelligently make the decision, this is what I need to do. And the jailer, he brought them into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. And the next morning, word comes down from the magistrates, we need to release these guys. So apparently, after the jailer had them at his house, put them back in jail. Uh, which, which would have been, I, I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the side of the wall when that conversation happened. Well, Paul, thanks for saving my soul. Thanks for all you've done. Now you got to go back into jail. Well, I mean, if, if Paul, if Paul knew the consequences of him leaving, and he just converted this jailer, there is no way in good conscience he could walk out the door. Right. Right. So it wouldn't surprise me if Paul said, "This, you know, this this was done so that you'd believe. I'm not going anywhere, and neither are any of these guys." Right. Oh, because now the jailer was a brother in Christ. Yeah. And woe be to anyone to cause harm to another brother in Christ. Exactly. Certainly Paul would never do that. So, uh, you know, I just, I just find that interesting. So the next morning they, uh, and the jailer, uh, let's see. Now when they came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jail reporter, the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, "The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace." And Paul says, "No way, Jose. These guys publicly beat me, strip me, throw me in jail. I'm a Roman citizen. They did that without benefit of a trial, without benefit of conviction." But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. That no way, Jose, was a paraphrase. But let them come themselves and bring us out. And so the policemen reported their words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And the reason why these magistrates were afraid is because it was against Roman law and custom to subject any Roman citizen to humiliating punishment. Roman citizens could not be crucified. Roman citizens could not be whipped publicly. And uh, the magistrates realized that they had really, really messed up that if word got back to Caesar that they had treated Roman citizens this horribly, well, the magistrates were going to be in deep trouble, possibly losing their position as a minimum, maybe even to the extent of losing their lives. 
And so Paul wanted to be exonerated. Paul wanted these guys to come down, escort them from the jail, to let everybody know that they had done nothing wrong, deserving of the punishment which they had been subjected to. And they came and appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city out of sight, out of mind. Please, just, just go in peace. Go. Let's go. Let's just take off. No harm, no foul. Darlene? So the jailer takes them to his house, but then they go back to the jail? Yes. To, to finish out their term or something? Well, the, or they weren't jailed for any particular time, but again, under Roman law, the jailer was responsible for the prisoners. If a prisoner escaped, yeah. then the jailer would be put to death. Yeah. And so that, that was a concern. Wes? It, it's, it's highly likely that the jailer's home was either above or next door to this jail. So it wasn't it wasn't like they took a you know a trip a fifteen minute trip to the jailer's house and then had to all come back. They were already there. Yeah. Just in the call a park. cab, get out the front door, go to the jailer's house, call yeah. a cab or we will come back. <laughs> yeah. Back yeah. Again. <laughs> so it, yeah that, that that makes sense. Yeah. It also explains why the jailer was there you know, through, throughout the middle of the night, and he could, you know, respond quickly to things. And yeah, well, I mean, it, there's a lot that could explain that. I mean, if my life was on the line, I might have been in a jail to make sure that nothing happened. You know, and before I dozed off, I would have made sure the shackles were firmly affixed, that the doors were firmly locked. <sighs> so. So Paul and Silas, after they get out of jail, they don't immediately leave Philippi. They return to Lydia's house. They visited with the brethren, encouraged them, and then left. And just in note that in verse 39, they came and appealed to them, brought them out, begging them to leave. They went out of the prison. Uh, they saw the brethren. They encouraged them and departed. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis, if, and the reason why I'm making the point of that is because it, it appears that Luke is not going with them, that Luke is staying in Philippi. If you look back at the beginning of chapter 16, in, in verse 4, Luke writes, they were passing through the cities. Verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region. In verse 8, in passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. Then in verse 11, so putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposing that they were. So there's a change in pronoun. And so now we're back to they. So the, the implication is that, remember, Luke was probably from Philippi. There was a medical school in Philippi, which is probably where Luke uh, was trained as a doctor. And uh, so Luke probably remained in, uh, in Philippi. And, and one other point before we move on from chapter 16 is that it is perfectly acceptable for a Christian to appeal a false conviction, to use the laws that are there for their benefit they don't have to, they are not without recourse if they are mistreated. And it's perfectly acceptable for them to file appeals to, uh, to litigate their innocence or to 
get redress of uh, their mis of mistreatment. As Americans, we have certain rights, those embodied by the First Amendment, where we have the right of speech. We could speak, we could say whatever we want. We can say that Jesus is Lord, Jesus loves me, Jesus is God. Some people may find that offensive. Well, too bad. I have the absolute right to say that. You don't have to agree with me, but you cannot, by law, prevent me from saying that. I have the right to meet peacefully with other like-minded individuals to petition my government for a redress of grievances. I have the right to worship God, to practice my religion as the Bible requires me to, and that the government cannot make a law which abridges that right or which creates a, a government religion. So it's perfectly acceptable, as Paul did. He asserted his rights as a Roman citizen and uh, held the magistrates to account. Questions? Comments? Moving on. Now, Paul is going to a town which, for the longest time, I had no idea how to pronounce I have been pronouncing it as Thessalonica for many, many years. And my understanding, the correct pronunciation is Thessalonica. So uh, let's begin reading. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis in Apollo Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous, as an aside, here we go again. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men, have upset the, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. So it's the same old story. We've been here before. Uh, they, they travel. That's all I like. Or the, the tea thing. Is if you look up at the top of the Aegean Sea where the arrow is pointing, nicely from a, a tech man. It's due west from Philippi, and it's also uh, one of the major ports and major cities of the region of Macedonia. It had great military uh, strategic importance and it got its name from, it was named after the daughter of Alexander the Great by one of Alexander the Great's general who married the daughter. It's in my notes, which we won't, be re we won't revisit that, but, but that's where Thessalonica gets the name. And there were apparently a, a sizable Jewish population because there was a synagogue. You know, you recall in Philippi, there were no synagogues. Why? Because it was mostly peopled by 
retired Roman legionnaires. Uh, and so there was mostly Gentiles. But here in Thessalonica, there, there was a synagogue. And Paul, as is his habit, and went to them. And three Sabbaths, how long is that? How much time had passed those three Sabbaths? What's a Sabbath? That many Sabbaths. Well, I would think three weeks, if they were there for three Sabbaths. I'm going with three weeks. Yeah. I'm simple. You know, three Sabbaths, three weeks. You know, if you, if you tell somebody, I, I was there for three Saturdays, they're going to understand you were there for three weeks, right? I mean, reasonable? Although your point is also reasonable, Will. I don't want to say that, uh, you know. <laughs> See, and, and, that's, and that's the problem with, with investigating crimes and, and accidents, because you've got three people that, same, see, that see the same event, but you get three different stories, or each person is, a fact is more important to them than the other two, so it's hard to get it all together. Like here, you know, two weeks, three weeks, all right. Anyways, he was there for, he wasn't there overnight. He was there for a while. And it took a while for the Jews to start getting angry. And, and as we, as it seems to me is what's happening is that the Jews are jealous. Well, that's what the text says. They were jealous of the success that Paul has been having by using scripture, the Torah, to convince Jews as well as believing Gentiles uh, that, that the new, that the gospel was true, that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, incidentally, that's what precipitated my lesson tonight is that as I was preparing this and I was doing some looking into the Christ, uh, I, sometimes God reaches down and gives me a little kiss on the head and says, Make a great devotional. Well, great is in, in your, but. One of my notes. About yeah. the Sabbath? Yeah. About the Sabbath, all right. No, this, what, it's okay. All right. Uh, it says uh, three Sabbath days. These two weeks represent the time spent in the synagogue uh, reasoning with the Jews, not Paul's total time in Thessalonica. An analysis of the Thessalonian letters reveals that Paul had taught them much more doctrine than would have been possible in two or three weeks. So it was more than the two or three weeks. I believe I said it was at least three weeks. No. You were trying to sell that there two you weeks stuff. So. You got it. That's why I don't argue with the teacher. <laughs> Well, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a chestnut. <laughs> it's, a, it's more of a blind squirrel thing than a, a gifted teacher of scripture. But, you know, I, I appreciate the comment. And, and that's, that's why we're here, is to talk of these things. And, and to the, the ultimate objective is to find the truth of what scripture is teaching us. And, and I'm not too proud to say I am mistaken, because I've had so much practice saying I have mis been mistaken. Darlene. Maybe I missed something, I just missed it, but who's Jason? Jason is a person in Thessal Thessalonica where Paul and Silas and Timothy were staying. You know, when they went to Philippi, they met a woman named Lydia, yeah. She and she invited them to her home, and yeah. that was where they stayed during their stay at Philippi. Yeah. Well, the influence here at Jason is, is the same thing. He, he, he possibly he was a believer, possibly he was a brother, and uh, they were at his house. It 
so he was having an effect explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. These leading women were probably the wives of the aristocracy, probably the wives of leaders, magistrates, uh, nobles, businessmen who were very high in the food chain of, of local Thessalonican culture. And so uh, that's who these leading women were. Lydia would be described as a leading woman of Philippi. Not because of any power that she had, but she uh, 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 was well off. I think we're going to stop there and talk about the Jews becoming jealous and the trouble that they caused as it's just a minute or so before 8. So let's stop there, and we'll pick it up there. next week. Any questions? Any comments? Thank you for your attention.